Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on the time zone you're in. Welcome to our annual webinar uh, 2021. And this is an event we've been hosting since 2015. And our goal here is to share some insights from the previous match season, offer you tips, guidance for your, for your journey. So today I'm joined by some of our match students, uh, some of the residents and uh, each one of them, like you, have had a unique journey. They've had their own challenges. They have had their issues. They've had to overcome to match. Some of them are older graduates, uh, repeat applicants, uh, have had attempts, low scores, fear interviews, lack of research, tele-rotations. But with all their grit and determination, they've made their own path to the, to the match goalpost. Uh, before we get started, for those of you who don't know about our team, uh, we've been helping IMGs and the Caribbean applicants since 2015. Uh, now over 2,300 alumni we have across all specialties. And you can you know, go to our website, uh, take a look around our services on PSCV, interview prep, research, rotations. So that's, today is not the time to market, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, back to our agenda, we have divided this session into various categories and each of the speakers will share their challenges some tips to overcome those challenges and of course uh, i do have uh, dr Pranith reddy from our, our team who's moderating on facebook and he will get us the questions so if you have some questions you can type it in here and uh, we'll go with that so the first thing we want to talk about is repeat applicants, or I'm sorry, the older year of graduation. So we've had various questions. We've had many students who are older YOGs, and I want to just go to some of those uh, successful applicants who have matched with uh, older uh, year of graduation. So let me turn it over to Dr. Bharti Nikare and Dr. Ibinabu. Uh, all yours and share your experience as an older graduate and uh, how you succeeded in math. So maybe Bharti first to you and then to Ibinabu and others can chip in. All right, thank you Pavan, thank you very much. Hello everyone, this is Bharti. Uh, I am an international medical graduate. I graduated in 2007 and I have a home country residency that to in preclinical subject, anatomy. So as such, I do not have much clinical experience back in India. I moved to US in 2014, but um, then I just started working as a teacher. I was working as an educator to uh, undergraduate students. So I, uh, last year I applied with complete application. I had only one interview that to uh, courtesy interview, I couldn't match in there. Uh, I definitely felt really devastated. I understand how you all feel right now. I can feel you. This year, I had to make a game plan for that. And uh, Pavan and the Sasa team really helped me to find out what I should do. So to overcome my year of graduation, what I can do. So first thing, clinical experience, of course. I had to get more and more clinical experience here in the United States. Last year I applied with six months of clinical experience. This year I applied with like 16 months of clinical experience. So I was glad that I could get more clinical experience. I would tell you how. But um, other than that, step three is really, really important for all old graduates. So I, I, this is my you know, final verdict. You might say that step three is the one which can take you, you know, or break you. So you better take step three if you are older grad, okay? And the uh, USCE I was talking about. So this year, I when I got to know that I did not match, like actually last year, um, it was March and you know all, all that we had this COVID and we didn't get any, all the rotations got canceled. We had nothing else to do. Um, so what I did is I tried to approach as many doctors as possible through all the social media, especially Facebook and LinkedIn. I tried to contact all of them, uh, uh, apply, called all the uh, free clinics uh, all over the country. So those are the people who are federally qualified. They need hands. They don't have, you know, many people to help in there. So I tried to get as much, uh, give help 
as much as possible. I could get, you know, only one call out of that. And finally I got into um, as a medical assistant. And that is what I got to, you know, grab that opportunity as uh, a medical assistant and then kept on working as a medical assistant for a long time. So for you, I understand that COVID is still here. I would say just keep outreaching, that's really important. And other than that, uh, get as much help uh, with as as much help as possible from all of uh, our team, especially the SARC team. They have really helped me in this my in my this match. I pre matched. I didn't go into match really, but um, I could say that for all the steps I could need, like CV, PS, Sarthi is the one who helped me in that. So um, that's it. Pavan, I think that's what I would like to say that go ahead with step three and uh, USC for older grads. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Dr. Ibinabu. So why don't you introduce yourself and some of the challenges you overcame and your tips for the other applicants who may be applying this year? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ibinabu and I'm an IMG from Nigeria. Um, so just like Rashi he said, I'm also an older grad and I mean, more, the steps she took very much similar to what I did as well. Um, the main concern about being an older grad is your clinical skills. And that's where the US clinical experience comes in. So the question now was, how do I increase my US clinical experience? And at the time I live in a smaller area, like I'm not, I'm not in a big city. So these opportunities were not so widely available. So I did a major outreach. I basically emailed every doctor. I have only, there's only one hospital where I live that has a residency. And I emailed every doctor on their, on their website asking for, a, for an opportunity to um, get US clinical experience. And out of everybody, one, I got one positive response. And that was how I managed to get um, three months of um, US clinical experience and then COVID started and that was it. And then I saw a free clinic where they were willing to have me come in once a week. And that was an additional form of clinical experience. So I guess for me, the three key things were, were outreaching to everybody. You never know who would say yes, but don't be put off by the no. You just have to keep on pushing past the no as well. And now mentorship was really important for me. And that's where SETI came in because I'm coming from a totally different cultural system. The US system is different. And this is where SETI like guides you through the process. So it's just in terms of your CV preparation, your personal statement preparation as well. And more and importantly as well, your interview preparation. Like I remember the, um, when I was, I, 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 I was putting up all my, applica my application together and someone said, oh, just be yourself. That is a very, um, it's, it's a very tricky place because yourself might not be very great, you know, or you might not be the finest version. Let me rephrase that. So you need that extra finies. You need that extra help. And that's where SETI came in. The interview preps were phenomenal. Like everything covered, if, you're, if you went through with everything that SETI covered, you're good. Like you're, you would have you would know how to navigate through the interview and it's important. And another thing I felt the interview brought out where like it highlighted things that were important to the program, which previously I did not know. Like I didn't know knowledge of an EMR system was important. Apparently that's something a program likes to hear. They like to know how comfortable you are with the US. So those are the, the futures that SETI really highlights and that's where the mentorship and the preparation comes in. And it's like the old saying goes, it's like when preparation meets opportunity, that's when luck happens. So it's just important to just get all that help you can get. And um, yeah, I'm, I think that's pretty much my story. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Ibn Abu. Uh, so just to clarify, all these students have worked really hard. You know, it is their hard work, whatever they say about Sarthi, that's very <laughs> kind and humble of you, but it is your hard work that has seen you through. So let's be clear on that. 
before I move on to another, uh, so anyone else who uh, considers themselves older graduate and, and things like that, anyone wants to chip in? Yes, Priyanka. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm also an uh, older graduation and uh, for my story was kind of different because I immigrated to Canada and I faced a lot of obstacles uh, being a new immigrant in the country. And I, I would say many of you might have faced similar obstacles, right? Uh, but, you know, I always had this one set mind to match into family medicine, uh, whatever it comes, you know, so I kept trying uh, in Canada. I, I worked, you know, in various different uh, aspects of healthcare. So I worked as an ultrasound technician. I worked as a pharmacy technician. And at that time, I, I tried to outreach, you know, I, I would say networking is a big thing. You just speak with the physician there, ask them for an opportunity. That's how I, I started my, you know, experience in family medicine in Canada. And I started working there for two years. I worked in a telemedicine. I worked in an addiction clinic. Uh, and I also did my exams at that time. Uh, but last year was, um, I don't know, I was very upset because my all rotations got canceled. I was very unorganized. And I, I joined Sarthi at that time. And my all thoughts become very organized. I realized what the process is what to work towards, you know, improving your CV, your ERAS application, how to improve your interview skills, because I got a lot of feedback and I worked on those, my weaknesses. And that's how I improved my interview skills because keep working. So I have over seven years of work experience, but keep working and working towards, you know, getting matched into your dream uh, residency. It's very different. So I would say Arsati helped me a lot. And you just need one interview to match, you know, I, that's, that's all I will say. And hard work, dedication to your field and outreaching, it's must in uh, America. That's what I've realized and it worked for me really well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before I move on, Bharti, there is a question for you. Uh, did you get any certifications for the MA? This comes from Jason in the group. Hey, Jason. No, I didn't get the certification of medical assistant. One of the doctor needed uh, hands-on for like help, help for his her COVID uh, situation. And she just put me in. And then I actually cashed on that experience and got more medical assistant jobs. So yes, I, I started as an emergency person. Okay, thank you. And if I can just request the audience, we'll take the questions towards the end because a lot of your uh, questions may have already been answered by by our panel so if you can just hold on we'll take it to the end uh, now next category is repeat applicants so some of you may have been applying for multiple years and and then what challenges you faced and how you overcame so uh, Sukrut, Vikram uh, you know, some of those who applied as repeat applicants. So let me start with uh, so Dr. Sukrut Pagat. Why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll, you know, after your experience, uh, we'll go to Dr. Vikram uh, Vilani. Uh, thank you, Pawan. Uh, so my background is that I graduated in 2017 and I graduated from the Middle East. And uh, this is my third attempt. Uh, the first attempt was 2018, 2019, and 2020. And after each, uh, after learning not matching, you know, every single time I learned I didn't match, you know, though I was uh, distraught and devastated, I did find a way to pick myself up and have a game plan and um, sort of tackle the, the deficiencies in my applications. So I have a mediocre score. So my scores are 211, 230, pass and CS and 217 on step three. So I have a very, very below average score and I was adamant on applying for internal medicine specialty. That, that's the only thing I wanted to do. That's the only thing I applied for. That's the only thing that's on my CV. So despite the, you know, the scores that you cannot change. So I decided to gain more clinical experience. So I did a couple of months of sub-internship at a hospital. Uh, I decided to bulk up my CV by getting involved in research public and that's where Sarthi comes in. You know, they they help you. They they have a research course that can help you publish uh, research articles. So that's uh, where I helped uh, strengthen my application. Third thing is again. Uh, getting done with step three, I cannot emphasize is that, you know, every single panelist here will tell you the importance of step three. It is one of the most important thing for an international medical graduates. If you're an, even if you have extremely high scores of 230, 240 in step one, do not 
uh, stop or do not delay taking a step three because it is a requirement now for an IMG. It's something that it's granted that you need to take. So step three, US clinical experience, research publications, and one thing that from an applicant, from, you know, everybody's going to talk about their story. So I'm not going to try to overlap and say uh, uh, same things, but what is different in my story is I was very, very aggressive with my program outreach. And what I mean by that is uh, prior to the submission of applications, about two to three weeks, I sent uh, an email to everybody saying that, you know, I'm applying to your program. This is what, uh, this is what I bring to the table. Didn't, re didn't receive any response. It's fine. After the submission of my application, I sent out another email. I sent out another email every single week. And I, believe it or not, I received uh, two to three interviews because of that letter of interest. And the program that I matched was, <laughs> they sent an invite to me because of the letter of interest. And they spent about 30 minutes just talking to me, 30 to one hour just talking to me. And I fell in love with that program. So I cannot emphasize, you know, having a complete sync scores is not the only thing. CV, there are so many nuances to CV that we as an IMG don't really understand and don't really tackle. And that's where you need a mentor to guide you to this process. It just doesn't stop it. Oh, I have a 230, 240, and I have uh, two to three months of clinical experience, three LOs. No, it doesn't stop there. Your CV has to be perfect. Your personal statement has to be perfect. Your research publication has to be perfect. Your program outreach has to be perfect. So do not take lightly the mentorship aspect of whoever it be. So yeah, that's my story and uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Sukrut. Uh, very inspiring as uh, always. Uh, so Vikram, now let's go to you. You've tried, I think this is your third time, but you did also match into your dream specialty with limited number of interviews. What were the challenges and what did you do differently this year? Well, hello, my name is uh, Vikram Preet. Uh, and uh, I've been applying, as Sukhut said, also since 2017, and I got ECFMG certified uh, in 2017. So I went unmatched all those three years. And uh, so my strategies were changed when I met Sarthi because they guided me to the right direction. I was always focused on neurology. So I always knew this is what I wanted. And I kept building my CV in that I kept getting more clinical experience in that uh, public uh, doing publications and research work. Until uh, there was this COVID times, I was very challenging. So I did not want to interrupt my, uh, you know, clinical rotation. So I took some tele rotations through Sarthi. And I think that was very beneficial for me because in my interviews, I was really, uh, you know, they really talked about that with me that, you know, you've been engaged in this field, you know, through this time as well. And uh, which uh, they found very impressive that at least I did not, uh, you know, I wasn't doing anything. I'm just working in India. And um, Another thing that was a game changer for me in this season was the letter of interest, uh, which Hasarthi has always emphasized and how important it is. And so Prud has just mentioned about it. And uh, I really got some invites because of just my letter of interest, just conveying my interest because being an older grad and a repeat applicant, you know, sometimes your application might just get filtered. And uh, so it's very important for you to reach out to the program and convey your interest to them. So that was, that was a game changer for me. And uh, there was another thing, uh, the interview preparation. I think uh, we all need uh, some professional help with people who are of vast experience in this. And uh, I really have to thank Sarthi for that because, uh, you know, they will help you to talk about in the interviews how you cover your red flags. And if, uh, you know, if you have any anything on your application that really needs to be addressed, and, you know, you might not be prepared for that. So it's, it's very important to have a very great preparation for your interviews. And especially if you're a core grad and a repeat applicant. So um, I think these were the things uh, which were a game changer for me and they helped Thank me match. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, now, now let's go to Venus. Venus, you are also a repeat applicant, but you followed a different strategy. In pandemic, you were all over New York chasing every <laughs> rotation. So why don't you talk about your challenges in the pandemic yeah. and how you did it? Yeah. Thank you, Pavan. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Venus Sharma. I am an IMG from India. So obviously I was uh, shattered uh, when I received that email that, sorry, you're not matched in March. But uh, yeah, I picked myself up and uh, started working towards my goal again. And uh, while being in India, all the transportation was not there, flights were all canceled. So I started doing tele-rotations there from India only. I did two tele-rotations, one from Chicago and then another one from Miami. And uh, as everybody mentioned, <clears throat> I cannot emphasize enough on the importance of step three 
whether you are a recent graduate or an older graduate, step three is very, very important for an IMG. And as Dr. Pagat mentioned, that program outreach, aggressive program outreach is very important. I started it from mid of June, taking the advice from Sarthi team itself. I started sending them emails from June itself. Firstly, I did it monthly and then every 15 days and after I applied almost every week, I send them emails. And yes, talking about my USCE during the pandemic in New York, I was all over the place. I did um, US clinical experience from November till February. And uh, during each and every interview of mine, I was asked this question, why, uh, what are you doing right now? Where are you? Are you working somewhere? Uh, where are you situated? Are you in India or are you in are you working there means they were expecting you to work somewhere even during the pandemic and they were quite impressed when I told them that yes I'm working as an observer here in a clinic with this and this doctor and they I guess almost 10 minutes were there what are your responsibilities what do you do in that clinic are you seeing COVID patients and everything so I feel that USCE is very very important uh, even during your interview season, uh, doing USC is uh, something which has helped me. And that's why I matched into my uh, dream uh, residency and into the dream program of mine. <laughs> and I cannot thank Sathi team enough. And I guess it was the best decision of my life to join Sathi. And again, mentors, I cannot thank Dr. Koshi enough. My interview skills were polished. Uh, the mock interviews are really, really, really very helpful and they definitely, I was not taken by surprise by any question. I feel like I was navigating whole of my interview. <laughs> so yeah, the interview skills are another important things which everyone need to emphasize on. So yeah, this was my journey. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Venus. Uh, okay, so then let's quickly move on to low scores, attempts and and you know how our, some of our students have navigated that. You heard something from Sukrat, but I do want to go to Karandeep. Uh, Karan, your experience and you know how you navigated uh, uh, your profile given the constraints. So I'll let you introduce yourself and what challenges you faced. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so I'm Karandeep. I am uh, I am a 2018 graduate. So I have a CS. Uh, oh, sorry, I have a CS failure. Uh, so that is something that I. Uh, I struggled with a lot because uh, I was supposed to give my exam in April, but then obviously the exam got suspended and it never uh, happened again. So, uh, so one of the problems was that now how do I show to the programs that I actually have good clinical skills because my only exam and my only attempt I went uh, failed uh, in there. So, so first of all, the most important thing that helped me was program outreach. And I think that so many have already mentioned here already. So I got a good number of interviews just with the outreach only. So, I mean, I met so many kind program directors who were, who were willing to give me a chance. And I very clearly had mentioned on my email that I have this attempt and, uh, but I still am very uh, engaged in the studies and I plan to take my step three very soon. Uh, so please do consider my application. And that really did help me in getting the invites. Uh, so, but the real magic happened after I gave my step three. So of all the interviews I got, uh, almost half of the interviews I got after I cleared my set three and obviously updated the programs about it. So definitely do work on your set three as well, because set three will not only compensate for your, uh, for your low scores or your attempts, it, it, it's there, it's going to, uh, overcome all the other red flags that there might be on your application. So that is the, that is something that you all can do. And, uh, other than that, uh, what I think uh, really helped me was uh, that I was able to grab a remote research position uh, because I knew that that, is some, that was also a part that was not very good on my profile. I mean, I had a few publications, but I was not involved with any institution. So I couldn't get any in-person position, but I think that is, that is okay. Even if you don't, even if you're not able to find any in-person position, you should know that research is a very wide area. So you can anyway, just work from your home only and uh, you can get in your profile added the name of some big institution that okay that you're working with them over some article or something that and that is something that i almost every interview asked me about and they were very impressed with my role in it and everything so uh, definitely do consider uh, adding that to your application and um, uh, and one of the last things that i want to add is that i did apply into two specialties because again i was worried of going unmatched and also the these were the two specialties that i really liked uh, and thought that okay i would be happier in either now, this is a tricky part. Uh, it's not 
uh, I mean, be very uh, sure that if you want to apply into two specialties, that you are not compromising on either one. That you are able to at least balance both of them on your profile. And uh, and also, I am sure that I would have been affected at least to some extent because uh, you can't make your profile. I mean. perfect in neither of those specialties right so you have to make some compromises from somewhere so it's very tricky so um, just make sure that you navigate through it uh, well and that is somewhere that sarthi really helped me pavan sir really helped me and uh, just making sure that i that if that if that was something that i wanted to do that they helped me a lot uh, in just um, doing all these things and advising me through all this so yeah thank you thank you very much uh, karan appreciate it now let's uh, go to a similar topic which is complete change of specialty so uh, we have harman preet with us uh, extensive fm experience uh, quite a bit of fm experience but wanted im and ended up i don't know 20 plus interviews in im so uh, harman preet why don't you talk to us about changing this specialty and how did you go about it okay thank you pavan For, um, first of all uh... my name is harman preet and i'm a student in internal medicine at a university program with significant family medicine experience so um i graduated in 2018 and then i moved to canada um, in mid of 2018 so for one and a half year i did family medicine rotations i rotated at one clinic for one year and then six months at another clinic um then but i always wanted to get into internal medicine i don't know what happened in between because i thought uh, i had since i have a lot of family medicine experience i would go on and, and apply into family medicine and then i talked to pavan uh, he told me you have good chances of making into internal medicine since i have good scores just focus on getting a uh, specialty specific uh, clinical experience so that's what i did um also my profile was lacking research so i enrolled in a sathi research course and um, i got involved in a research project and um i think the things that worked in my favor were one my scores two well written cv and personal statement uh i cannot stress enough these things are really really important a well written cv that has been edited and personal statement really i mean show your personal statement to a lot of people like as many people as you can show and uh, like get uh, feedbacks on your personal statement and edit it i worked on my personal statement for yeah. about 2 3 months i showed it to almost 10 people so just work on every single part of your application and then i think a lot of points the uh, other uh, panelists they covered uh, focus on program outreach and another thing that worked in my favor were letter of recommendations so uh, since i did rotate did rotate with some physicians for such a long time they knew me inside out so they wrote really good letters for me uh, so even though they were from uh, from fa- family medicine practitioners they wrote uh, really good things about me and they were i know that one uh, uh, mentor he wrote me a two and a half pages letter so these letter of recommendations were really important in my case and they helped me get a lot of invites and uh, a lot of interviewers they they folk they literally said that my letters were really good so these can get you a lot of invites so uh, i would uh, ask you to focus on your usce and rotations and try to get uh, good letters quality over quantity that that will what uh, that is what i'll say and yeah uh, focus on interview prep i think other panelists they covered it uh, really uh, well and uh, um, i mean yeah i think that's it that that's what i would like to say and uh, even if you want to switch into another specialty that's possible yes focus on specialty specific rotations and i'm someone who uh, had only outpatient uh, rotations i didn't have any inpatient uh, rotations and i matched to a university program with literally uh, not much research and only outpatient rotations so it is possible i'm a living example in front of the, in front of all of you and uh, just work hard and in your personal statement one more thing if you have some kind of struggles in your life personal life struggles or any significant uh, event that happened in your, in your life any struggle or anything mention it and mention it in a positive way what what did you do to overcome it how did that make you a better person how will that help you in residency and uh, in the future uh, they really care about it and they they take that into consideration so uh, these will be my advices to all the future applicants 
Thank you, thank you, Harman Preet. Now let's move on to someone who had extensive research experience and used that to match in a university program. So, so Ramya, let's go to you. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us how you leverage research to match and among other sure. things. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's great to be here today and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Ramya. I am a medical graduate from India and um, I always knew I wanted pediatrics right from medical school. Uh, so when I came into the US, I did all my rotations in, in pediatrics. But while I came in for my uh, clinical rotations, I also started talking to physicians I was working with about research opportunities right from day one. I used to um, extend help in completing their research papers, write simple case reports, review articles. So that let me maintain a communication channel for years, right from my first, uh, as a medical student to now. Um, I continued working remotely with many of the university professors I was uh, rotating with as a clinical, um, during my clinical rotations. And uh, that kind of led me to the position that I got as a research scholar um, in a children's hospital itself. Uh, that was, I think, just continuing to talk to professors you work with at any point helps. And uh, remo remote re research uh, helps as much as in-person research because you do get publications. And uh, that helps you kind of get uh, basic science research or, or clinical research that you want in um, the hospital of your choice because you do have, you know, you do have uh, things to support your interest in. And also about having... Uh, having your subspecialty or specialty chosen early on kind of helps channel your story accordingly. And you also have answers to say when they ask you what you want to do um, after your residency. You, you, when you have a plan and you have clarity, they kind of appreciate it and uh, engage with you more on that. And also you, you can have commonalities when you find professors from different universities uh, within subspecialties, you have something to talk about. So ensure you do uh, rotations in different subspecialties so that you have a wider net of you know common things to talk about during your interviews. And also reaching out to people um, via emails can be easier when you have certain things in common with them and they always respond to you and you know, there's something to talk about in common. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ramya, appreciate it. Now let's switch gears and you may be thinking recent graduates don't have their challenges, but they also you know, have to navigate this journey. They do it their own way. So let me get some recent graduate experiences, how they planned and went about it with USC, without USC. So I'll go to Bharat first and then Ilya and, and then we'll you know, move on. So Bharat, uh, uh, talk to us about recent graduates, how sh should they plan and uh, you know, how you navigated everything. So over to you. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. So um, I would just like to put out there that uh, definitely being a recent graduate does have its, uh, its, its obstacles that you have to overcome. A lot of people tend to believe that, okay, you're a recent grad, you're a sure shot match, but it's, it's definitely not straightforward as, as a blank check. Uh, I think the the most important thing uh, as a recent graduate is to is, is to starting ahead, because a lot of people during medical school uh, are not as proactive enough in in trying to reach out to people, uh, their college alumni, their own attendings, in in seeing whether they have any contacts in the U.S. if they could uh, get you in touch with anyone, uh, be it for rotations, for research, anything, or even anything as simple as just reaching out and seeing what programs I should apply for, what. Uh, geographical areas in the US you should leverage. So uh, I think being proactive is very important, especially if you're an intern year or in fine medical school. Um, start planning ahead, definitely. Uh, one of the things I did was during my intern year, I just opened a, a sample ERA CV and just saw all the fields in there and realized that I've got to fill out something because I really didn't uh, want to leave out something blank. So those are kind of the dynamics I work towards. So I, uh, even though I had uh, reasonably good scores, I had a high 250s on step one and low 260s on CK. Uh, and I uh, used my research uh, as uh, during the pandemic because I only had one month of USC from an externship and just one tele rotation. So I kind of used that time to work on research uh, and 
also i think knowing your specialty uh, ahead of the game helps because you need to know your audience so i matched neurology at uh, one of the more reputed programs in the us and uh, i kind of already knew that yes neurology likes research uh, they like contacts they like knowing that you know people within the field so uh, that those are probably the things that recent graduates should should target and work towards Uh, so one of the things you didn't mention was your humility low to 60s i like that you know i have low to 60s so now let's go to ilia who had low to 70s as a recent graduate so so ilia what how did you plan this uh so for me it was uh the same prior proper preparation prevents poor performance i really tried to to do that because uh i don't uh it is up to you to prepare well to do all these things correctly so you are not to be a repeat applicant and for me it was also i think humility because when i received my step scores uh, still i knew that there there still after step 1 and step 2 there are lots of things to do and i decided to uh, contact sarki team and they really helped me with uh, all my other applications uh, because I remember I I think that uh, everyone can remember then when they just uh, register on era site uh, era's website and see not uploaded not uploaded empty spaces it, it just exhausting and uh, no one really can write personal statement from first attempt uploaded and be uh, brilliant uh, so sarki team helped me with uh, polishing my uh, cv uh, editing personal statement and after that after uh, september 15th or this uh, season october 21st uh, the most important thing is interview skills uh, like nothing else matter after that point you have your interviews and you especially this year um, with, with all things being virtual you have to present yourself answer questions and uh, as it was said and navigate interviews so you would address things that are important to you and present yourself uh, in a in a good way and um, sorry to team help me with that i matched in a great program and everything everything was great and probably one was one more thing about this season that uh, my rotation was one was cancelled it was transformed from inpatient to outpatient this is a minus but uh on the upside i had rotation in new york and uh, lots of students were recommending me to just not go there it is dangerous but still i went there and it was a fantastic experience working during this time with great doctor and getting the uh, things that you can tell like in your life with your friends and certainly during interviews thank you thank you elia So then let's move on to something related uh, you know uh, I I know this uh, unique path of three other uh, panelists here so whether it is home country work experience you know in covid times or lack of usc that tanya had or leaving home country residency midway i think that vaishnavi had and then patrick i, I think you're still working in india so uh you three had very different kind of uh, approaches to to this uh, journey especially last year so let's start with tanya tanya why don't you introduce yourself and how you leverage covid experience your tele rotations only uh you know that kind of thing so first of all thank you for having me and i hope my journey is an eye opener and something unique for everyone to learn from I too myself was a very recent graduate I graduated in June 2020 and I had absolutely no US clinical experience all my rotations that were already uh, taken were deferred because of covid and then later on they were cancelled completely so in my application there was a huge gap of work experience where I had nothing to show for it so my mentors and sarthi especially you sir you guided me so well on the fact that i should be taking telemedicine rotations very seriously so much so that i did two telemedicine rotations simultaneously one in the morning slot one in the evening so that i could get more experience on my cv also what helped me the most was covid experience in my home country so i was working in one of the most reputed hospitals in india 
and I was working in COVID wards, both the emergency and the ICU. So that was something that even that was something that the entire world was experiencing, actually. So this was a very common ground that I had that I could leverage and talk to absolutely anybody in the interview, from a program director to a head of a department. I had my field open to me. So there were a lot of questions that I also submitted to Sarthi later that everybody else can uh, view what all type of questions I was asked. So my interviews were slotted for 15 minutes, but they did go up to 20 to 25 minutes just talking about COVID and what I was doing currently, what was happening. So the way the interview happened, the interview prep was very important for me, but what played the magic for me was the COVID experience in my home country that interested a lot of program directors in my interviews. So that was something that was a very big feather in my cap. So I'm grateful for the Sati team for guiding me through this journey like that. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, let's go to you, Vaishnavi. Again, a unique path, uh, you know, had to leave home country residency midway. Uh, how did you manage uh, last year? Uh, thank you, Pavan. Thank you for this opportunity. And my name is Vaishnavi. So as you already mentioned, I had my, I was doing my residency in home country, which was DNB uh, medicine. So my path all of a sudden changed after I got married and I had to move here. And that is when I started my uh, taking steps and everything in 2019. So it was kind of hard. I gave all my steps uh, and uh, I was supposed to do my elective or sorry, observerships in 2020. But then the COVID happened and every university got shut down. All the universities got shut down. Research got stopped. So I, but at that point, I, I gave a call to you and asked, uh, and my CS also got canceled. So being an old grad uh, in 2016 grad without a CS, I, re I didn't think I'll have a chance. So, and uh, there were nothing about OET back then and all, all that OET stuff came up in August. So I had to bulk up my CV by at least doing rotations in the United States. So all that I had, all the rotations I had was an outpatient setting. And I want to tell future applicants that maintain a balance between outpatient and inpatient. So this is a year, they, this was an exceptional year. It is still fine to have only outpatient, but the coming years, they are not going to spare that uh, imbalance between outpatient and inpatient. I had a lot of questions uh, asked that you left your residency. So you, you had a bulk of uh, inpatient experience back then, but now you do not have anything in the United States. But they did have their own explanation because there was COVID-19 and people were not letting into the hospitals. <clears throat> but I think I would suggest my juniors to have a great balance between both of them so that you're not... Uh, um, uh, blasted with all the questions in the interviews and one other thing I would really want to emphasize is um, applying on time so that is really really important so make it even if possible apply two days earlier but never late so once you apply every single day uh, as it passes the August 21st deadline I think your number of interviews will come down really drastically so don't do that mistake take everything and start your CV and PS at least four to five months ahead of uh, everything. Yes, CV, you need to add, keep adding up every month or whatever you're doing, but PS and CV starting earlier, it'll help you actually think and uh, write in your CV. And if you started in the last minute, you're just going to just push up things into your CV. And I don't think there'll be grammatical errors in the CV is the biggest mistake. And what Dr. Kira was telling you all the time was do not make such mistakes. Start early. Uh, till the deadline, at least revise your own CV and P um, PS at least a million times so that you don't uh, know what other stuff you have in the CS and PV, uh, CV and PS when you go to the interview. So yeah, I took all the suggestions, whatever Dr. Kira was uh, giving me in this whole journey. He was really, really helpful. Thank you, Dr. Kira. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Uh, let's go to you, Patrick, uh, someone who refused a pre-match, uh, you know, all that. So why don't you talk about your background, your journey, and especially the last one year? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Pavan. Um, so my name is Patrick. I'm an IMG from India. I graduated in 2016. And after that, I was working in the ER as a physician. So I worked for like three to four years. And um, after that, so I made a game plan with my mentor from Sarthi. So me and my mentor, we really loved uh, making plans really uh, far ahead. So our plan was to like, you know, do four months of rotations in the US 
and uh, do like six months of research right before um, application deadline, which is like in September. So unfortunately the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And uh, so my research was canceled and I didn't have any research experience, but nowadays most applicants do have some kind of research on their CV. So um, I contacted Pavan, I contacted the Sarthi team and they hooked me up with the research um, team uh, course that they have. And then I was I, like, I, I studied how to do research. I did a, a publication with the help of the Sarthi team. And after that, I did a few uh, publications with my friends as well. So then I discussed with my mentor and then was the game plan, like, you know, we had to change the whole game plan because COVID was there. So now the game plan was that we have to make the CV in such a way that it's surrounded by COVID. For example, like, you know, with the research, we made sure that we had two publications, which was related to COVID. Um, he told me to go back to India, work as an ER physician so that uh, I have experience handling COVID patients. And even in volunteering work, it doesn't have to be anything which is significant. Like it doesn't have to be anything medical. I was just packing food for people um, who actually needed food, uh, like for COVID-19 patients. So um, my whole CV was covered with COVID. So when I, I, so I actually got 20 interviews and one pre-match offer as well. So during each interview, everybody was asking me what was going on during the COVID-19 pandemic in your home country. They were trying to compare what the healthcare system was in India as well as in the US. Um, they, they asked me like, you know, why did you do a research on COVID-19? Like, you know, there's many other topics. So they were really interested in that. And they really loved the fact that I had like, you know, four months, four years of experience working as, in the ER as well. So I think all these kind of um, aspects really helped me out. And I think that I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, during your journey, there might be a lot of obstacles. For, for example, for us, it was COVID-19 pandemic. But for you, it might be something else. But if you are determined and if you are willing to like, you know, work hard, you can overcome any obstacle. That's the beauty of the US Omni journey. And that's what um, Sarthi is here for. I mean, they really helped me out with everything. Um, I wouldn't be at this position right now. I've matched my, into my top program and I'm grateful to the whole Sarthi team. Thank you, thank you, uh, Patrick. So before we open up for questions, uh, anything that we missed or anything that any of my panelists would want to add, you may have missed it. So uh, if you want to add something before we open up for questions, anything at all? I actually uh, did want to add something regarding uh, personal statements. When you know that you are going into a particular spe specialty, uh, ensure that you can at least specify which program and uh, program you really want to target, make a list of at least 15 to 20 programs that you really like and write personal statements specific to those programs, given that you're writing only one person statement, one uh, specialty specific person statement, you might have uh, more time compared to other applicants. So try to use that because that really helps. And I was able to get uh, invites from most of the programs I'd written um, personal sp uh, statement, which was very specific to them. Um, and of course the generic uh, person statement will work anyway, but this this helped me, I felt. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tanya, you had something to add? Yes. Um, so I was, uh, I wanted to specify the fact that even with telemedicine rotations that I had, my LORs were so amazing that the program that I matched to one of the doctors actually read out those letters to me. And she was impressed by the fact that the doctors who were the attendings in my telemedicine rotation had taken out the time to write that for me. So letters of recommendation are something which everybody will read. And you need to be having a reliable source who is writing you a letter of recommendation because every word included in that is something that defines your character outside of what you are presenting in your ERA CV. So I just wanted to specify on that, that even with telemedicine rotations, LORs did matter a lot. Yes, thank you. Venus, I think you had something to say. Uh, just adding on to Dr. Tindon's point, what I was going to say is just do your USC for the sake of doing USC. Really need to work very hard because in case I'm matched to that university where I did my rotation because of my letters only. Because my letters are strong and are very specific and during my interview they say that, oh, that doctor has given very strong recommendation for you. So I matched into the same program where I did my electives. So work really hard to impress your physicians. They will definitely help you out. Yeah. Yep. So that's Thank you. Uh, Priyanka, you had something? 
Yes, exactly. So um, I wanted to tell everyone that, you know, Sarthi will help you to get the interview. But once you have the interview, you should know your program really well, what they are looking for, if it matches your bandwidth. You Because when you when you dream that, okay, I want to do that for my future and it goes well with the interview, you know, it's, it's like a match. So if you know the program inside out, everything about them, what they are looking for into an applicant. And that has helped me a lot because I would say the program director right away was, um, you know, impressed uh, by me uh, because I, I wanted something, I'm a mature candidate and uh, they were looking for a mature candidate. So it's like a match for me. And uh, I only got three interview, but you know, I matched into my top choice just because of my thorough, I would say investigation into the program. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, if, okay, Vaishnavi, you had something. I was going to open up for questions, but yeah. Uh, sorry. So I just wanted to add up. So since I'm a 2016 graduate and I didn't have any research on my application, like literally zero. So when you do not have your, any of the four pillars, like the clinical experience scores and research, like if, if you don't have a full CV, mm -hmm. I would suggest divert that and have either good scores or either good USC or mm -hmm. either letter of recommendations. So do not let anyone say you that you cannot do this. Make, but without research, I could get almost 20 plus interviews being an old grad. So, and without step three as well. So do not let any negative influence you saying that you cannot do it. Or uh, I just wanted to give them a positive vibe that try till you achieve, uh, like you, till you match. And okay, so let me now open up some for some questions. I'll read the questions and, and hopefully we can answer and Dr. Reddy from our team is just collecting them. So maybe I'll, I'll go to you, George, on this. How to get research position? Obviously it is getting tougher. That's one question from Aisha. A related question from Ravan in Germany. Does research in home country count? It's not easy to find it in the US. I was able to find one in Germany, my home country. So two questions, you know, how to get a research position in the US and B, what if I don't get it, home country research? Yeah, I think, um, thanks for this question. Um, I think there are multiple aspects to this question. The first thing is, how do you know when it is time for you to do research? Make sure you prioritize research only after you're done with your, your steps. Um, you have enough U.S. clinical experience and, you know, <clears throat> possibly U.S. clinical letters. Um, research should not be the first thing that you jump into before doing all of these things, okay? So make sure you understand that and know if you're in that stage. So that's the first thing. Second thing is how do we go into getting experiences? Uh, just like you would email um, and get in touch with people during your clinical rotations, um, that's pretty much this the, you know, the sim similar way that you would be reaching out to people. So you can contact uh, different faculty in different institutions, um, you know, in a specialty or in a specific subspecialty that you are interested in, you can contact them and, you know, tell them that you are so-and-so, you are at, you know, at this part of your journey and you would like to volunteer for any research projects that they may have. You can list out the things you are comfortable with. Maybe you're you have zero experience in, re, um, in research, that's fine. Just let them know. Or maybe you have some experience in uh, doing literature review, let them know. So they can gauge your interest, they can gauge how much you can bring to the table and you can find your fit, you know, a perfect um, fit in terms of a position. Uh, the next thing is, what if you don't get a position in the US? It is absolutely fine to do research in, in a home country, um, situation, especially now with COVID, yes, it's harder. Um, so it's absolutely fine to do a home country research experience. But remember the two reasons why we tell you um, that US clinical, US research experience is better is one um, is to uh, network with people who will be able to vouch for you. Yes, research in any country is equivalent. You will be able to get publications out of, you know, either of them. But the advantage of doing it in the US is whether remote or in-person is so that you have people within the US who can vouch for you, who can call for you, who can write letters of recommendation for you. And people who will be reading those letters might be people who know these people. 
Um, so that's essentially the objective of getting your research experience. But at the end of the day, try to do what you can and as much as you can get. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. So Ramya, maybe I'll go to you for the next question. How many publications is a good number? This is a question that is coming up. And also, what do I do if I have unpublished research? I don't think the number really matters. As long as during interviews, you can talk about what you're really working on. If you have a clinical trial that you can talk about in depth and how it has changed you as a physician, I think that's more than enough. Um, in home country, I did have um, research experience, but I didn't have publications because I left before I completed it. But my uh, professor was able to uh, justify that in his letter when he submitted one for my um, residency application. So that helped. And uh, so, yeah, just as long as you're doing something and you can talk about it and relate it to you, your CV and where you're headed, I don't think the number matters. I think what you're working on matters more than the number of, of publications. It's very easy to publish case reports and review articles just like that for the sake of publishing. So, and they know that as well. So uh, I don't think the number matters. Okay, thank you. Now, many of you spoke about the importance of step three. So we have a couple of questions on that. Uh, what is a low step three score? What happens if I get a lower score on step three? Does it impact my application negatively? So on and so forth. So. Who wants to take this question? You know, a low step three score, how does it impact? Uh, Sukrut, yes. So for step three, uh, the I think the, the I think the average, correct me if I'm wrong, the average uh, step three is I think a 220. So there is, so if you pass, see for, from, a, from a residency, from a program director perspective, all they want is you passing the step three so that you can take the board <clears> exam. So the score per se doesn't matter. Now, if you are a candidate, uh, who who has a step one of uh, 210, step two CK of 220, and uh, step three, you get 200. Yes, that's going to hurt you, but it, it still doesn't matter that much because at the end of the program director, all they want is you passing step three. If you fail step three, then, then that's an additional issue because then they start questioning, can you actually take step three? Can you be board certified? Because all a program director cares is that percentage. They want to know the board pass rate. They don't want it low because then they lose their accreditation. They, they lose, there's a lot of issues with that. So in terms of a good step three, if you can score 220 and above, that's a really good score. If, if you have, so the other, the other approach, the other strategy is if you have low step one, low step two CK. So I personally know a friend who was a, who had a 200 in step one, 210 in CK, but somehow magically she got a 240 in step three. Now that, that made an impression on them because everybody, she received about 10 to 15 interviews because they wanted to talk to her. They wanted to know what happened. So in terms of step three, don't think of it as like, what score do I need? See that you get a good score. 220 and above is a really good score. Uh, if you get 215, it's fine, but don't uh, worry too much about it. Just see, make sure that you pass the uh, step three. Thank you, thank you. So I know Venus and Tanya, both of you spoke about importance of excellent LORs and all. So how do you define a good LOR? This question comes from Jason. What is a good LOR? So maybe uh, Venus, you wanna go first? Yeah, I'll go first. So according to me, the good LOR is how personalized your LOR is. So explaining that what all your responsibilities were, it should not be general that, oh, she's hardworking. Explain how was she working in the clinic? Explaining accurately what were her responsibility and how was she with the patients, with the staff, explaining all these things. And I would not uh, really say that the length really matters, but yeah, the matter written really matters a lot. So I had two letters which I can compare. You can see it on the Google. They have written that uh, what is a bad LOR and what is a very strong LOR. So bad LOR says that she's very hardworking. She is uh, having good communication skills. So explaining that how has she worked with me? How has she worked with the patients uh, is really does that something matters. So according to me, that is something what is a good and a strong letter of recommendation. And, and Tanya, anything you want to add on LORs? 
actually i think we must cover a lot of it yes you have yes the letter writer should be mm. writing what your responsibilities were but for example in my letter she also mentioned the fact that these were my areas of interest because i had shown that interest during my telemedicine rotation so it really did capture her attention and that is what she mentioned which was something completely unique and specific to me also uh, letter writers specify that this person is probably in the top 1% or 5% of all the people that i have ever worked with and i really would recommend that her skills will be advantage to you so some specific lines like these actually work a lot in your favor and what your personality traits are how your attitude is towards the patients comes a lot more in this letter okay thank you uh harmanpreet let me go to you personal statement do's and don'ts because you spoke about ps so now what are do's and don'ts yes yeah, so the personal statement as the name says it, it should be personal to you so it should like for example my story uh, i came to canada i had some struggles so i mentioned that in my uh, personal statement it should be ideally one page long four paragraphs it shouldn't be that long that the um, interviewer or i mean the selection committee would get bored reading it um it should contain the content uh, as in why do you want to get into this specialty and sh there should be some personal experiences uh that you should write down and uh i also mentioned one more thing like if you had some struggles in the past focus on positive aspects how that made you a better person how that made you a better applicant and if you, if there's a uh, an experience uh in your past with a patient that that really uh help you made make a decision towards a particular specialty you could mention it and uh, if you change specialty like for example my uh, experience was in family medicine i applied into internal medicine you could try and explain that into uh, in your personal uh, statement that uh, this these were the reasons and stuff like that try to cover your red flags in your personal statement so that that will help you get more invites you wouldn't have to explain that to them uh, like later on it will give you a chance to explain your red flags in your personal statement uh, without an interview so that will help you get invites uh, so i think these will be my uh, suggestions don't make it too long and uh, that'll be i think that's that's it if there's anything else you you, uh, you can add in yep. thank you thank you so ibina let me go to you and maybe bharti Uh, older graduates, uh, what is your take on doing observerships, rotations in programs which either don't have residency programs or don't take, uh, uh, you know, IMGs? So I know uh, even now you said you chased one hospital. So if if you were to get an opportunity to do rotations where there is no residency program, as an older graduate, what is your take on that? I would say I think basically. For my 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 reasoning is that the reason why you're doing the observership is to is to increase your clinical skills and to prove to the programs that I'm able to do it, which is what your letter of recommendation would show from that institution. So even though you don't match in that hospital or the program doesn't have any residency, it pays forward to your application. So it just shows proof that you have. knowledge of the us medical system and that you have the skills to work in the us medical system and yeah that's my take thank you uh, bharti what is your uh, recommendation older graduates uh, observerships rotations where should they target i would say it uh, as as zivina was said that it is not necessary that you are applying or you're going only to the programs which have the residency no uh, it it's um, you know observerships or clinical rotations are what you how you connect with the attending how you make an impression on the attending so for me this happened that what the telemedicine rotation i did uh, of course the telemedicine rotation doesn't go give you any residency mm -hmm. correct but the way i connected with him he is the, the attending is the one who talked with the program director i pre matched him so i would say that you just need to make that connection and it it will show up in your letter of recommendation or the attending would like to talk for you with the program director that's the important thing thank you and by the way i am aware that we are over our one hour time so if you any of the panelists need to go please feel free i i appreciate your time obviously different time zones 
Uh, so uh, don't feel obliged to stay. Uh, now the next question is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on using a two-year-old LOR? Anyone use two-year-old LOR? What are your, yes, Tanya? Uh, so one of my LORs was from 2017, one of the first observerships that I did in my field. However, I was in constant contact with my letter writer, my attending, and she obliged me with writing a fresh letter of recommendation with a new date, which I could use in my math cycle. So I would suggest anyone who's in this situation to keep in contact with your attendings and keep them updated with what's happening in your life, what you are doing in your future, and that would help building a relationship. And then you can definitely ask them if they would be available to write a letter of recommendation would be fresh. Okay. All right. I think these are most of the questions more or less that we got. So I wanted to thank all of you panelists, you know, uh, thank you for sharing your journey. This is very, very impressive. Hopefully this motivates uh, a lot of people uh, and they can follow your path. Uh, thanks again for your time. And uh, uh, to our audience, you can type in questions on, on Facebook. We'll get to it. But uh, you know, you can all do it as you've seen lower scores, higher scores, recent graduate, no research, a lot of research. There are various paths to it. You can all do it. Uh, just have a plan, stick to it and uh, good luck for the coming season. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. All my panelists, our students. Thank you. Thank good, you luck, so thank you. Thank you. good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.